In this video, we're going to talk all about making some incredible backstories for the heroes of your army. Okay. Welcome more gamers. my name is Doug with 2 Plus Stuff, and we're continuing our narrative series based that was started uh, last week, and the patrons over on Patreon voted to do a series talking about narrative play. How do you build a narrative-themed army, how do you build lore around them, and ultimately, how do you engage in narrative gaming in a meaningful way? As a quick aside, if you want a chance to vote on what kind of content comes up, please consider becoming one of my patrons over on Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, it does so much to support me as a content producer, as well as giving you access to uh, voting polls, there's all kinds of discussion about gaming and uh, hobby progress, things like that over there, so please go check it out in the show notes down below. Now today we're going to focus on creating backstories and narratives for the various heroes in your army. If you haven't heard me talk about it before, I really do believe that uh, as armies get larger, particularly with horde armies, the heroes take on a greater and greater importance for setting the tone, the theme, the temperament of these various factions. If you want to write a real detailed story arc for your forces and have um, development and things like that over the course of games, having named heroes with a reason to fight and what they liked, how they, sorry, how they like to fight and those kinds of things really goes a long way to creating that narrative. Just to preface, this is not a crash course on how to write novel length character backgrounds. We're just going to talk about the uh, ways that you can incorporate a lot of flavor into the models, the design of them, how they play on the tabletop, and just giving some fun examples of narrative play. To kind of give you an overview of where we're going, we're going to cover really four main kind of cornerstones, if you will, on how to create a character. And those are making a backstory, uh, how they fight in combat, uh, any flaws that they have, and character interactions. And we'll cover those in a little more detail. The first thing we need to do though is assemble all the resources that we need. Big resources that you might consider are say the core rulebook if you want them to be from a specific location. Having information about the realms and various names of locations in those realms is extremely, extremely helpful. Another great place to turn to is of course your battle tome. Now I do acknowledge that not all factions have a battle tome which is very important and I want to be very considerate of that. So what we're going to do is each one of these steps of the way that we're talking about character development we're going to be making together two characters. One is going to be from Night Haunts, because I'm theming Jess's army, and the other one I'm going to make up a free people's army um, off the top of my head, and we're going to work through that together so I can show you various elements that you can take from uh, models in the GW selection, as well as elements from established lore in battle tomes. But like I said, you don't need a battle tome to be able to do this. The core rule book is really your mainstay of all the meat that you need to create cool narrative things, as well as there's some little bits of information in, say, like the Malign Sorceries book, those kinds of things where you can draw those lore elements in. Don't forget Black Library books. If they include uh, a faction that you like, draw that inspiration in as well. Last note before we dig in is, uh, even though you're creating probably backstories for many, many heroes, depending on how many your faction usually runs, uh, what I would say is doing these steps for them individually actually adds to them wholly. I mean, uh, you wouldn't have an army that has 10 generals that all have the exact same history, right? In our real world, we don't do that. We have a general and lieutenants. They all have different motivations and complexities to them. So go ahead and do that. I would say start with the general of your army and work with me as we do this video and then go back and fill in the other heroes. Okay, so step number one, we're going to talk about the backstory for this hero. To that, we're going to basically turn to our core rulebook here and go to the realm section. The first question we're going to ask is where is our hero from? Now talk about which specific realm. If you're not familiar, people who live in a certain realm kind of take on the traits of that realm. By that I mean, for example, folks who live in Akshi, which are right there. Uh, tend to be very aggressive, hot-headed, brash, live fast, die young is kind of the mantra there. Now I also suggest looking deep, deep, deep at this map because you'll see all these various locations listed off here. What I would say is think about the kind of attitude you want to portray from your hero and pick a location that really reflects that. If you want your hero to be a rugged survivalist, maybe choosing a location from a mountain range would be a great idea. Or if you want them to be intelligent and sophisticated, maybe a more established city or stronghold of order would be a better choice. With those out of the way, you now have a hopefully a name that you've given your character, which I'm not going to talk too much about. Name them whenever you like. Uh, you have a location and also some general traits that we can assign to them. Now the next question I want to ask yourself is, how did they come into command? If they're a general, what was their rise to leadership like? If they're a lieutenant, how did they wind up under their superior officer? Oftentimes you'll find that the rise to power is sometimes just as fascinating as what people do when they actually have it. Was this a situation of being at the right place at the right time? 
Are they aggressive and power hungry and just kind of uh, shot straight to the top? Maybe they were assigned a uh, duty out in the field as a punishment for something that they did before. Maybe they're a ragtag bunch of warriors and they are the highest ranking officer left alive. They are not necessarily the general of an army, but everyone above them was killed in battle and so they are de facto a leader. That could be a very compelling storyline, someone who's not prepared for that mantle of leadership. Or for some of your more primal factions, mostly ones from destruction, it could be something as simple as they're a chieftain. Oftentimes battle tomes will de depict how leaders are selected within a faction. So leaning on those, if it's not a battle tome ready army, meaning they don't actually have a battle tome yet, uh, developing what that tribe looks like can go a long way. And the last question I wanna ask here is, what do they want? For example, if we're going back to our example of the uh, ragtag bunch of survivors where their general is kind of in charge by default, not because they've earned it, because everyone above them is dead, they, well, their goal, what they want, might just be to survive to get back to the city so that someone else can take command off his hands. Totally an understandable uh, motivation. If it's someone who is trying to uh, orchestrate a coup or something like that, they might have more malign motives and those kinds of things. Uh, architects of Zinch would have complex plans that you can dive into on how you think this force will make that happen. Really just think about how they got to where they are and how that fits into their grand plan. A few things to note when you're talking about motivations and what people want. You gotta remember, really everyone is kind of the hero of their own story. And this is something that was brought up by author John French when he wrote the 40k novel series for Aramon, which is a sorcerer for 40k. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But the idea being, uh, people, generally speaking, view themselves as a good guy. They have a reason for why they do what they do. So consider that. Uh, the weakest characters are the ones who just kind of you know twist their mustache because they're evil because evil reasons. But think about why your hero, your leader, would do the things that they do. If you are, for example, a believer of corn. Right, let's just take Slaves to Darkness, a corn-based faction, Oh well, and you assign the mark of corn to them, you want them to be corn-themed, I should say. Uh, why would that person be a devout follower of corn? Maybe they were raised in a tribe that was dedicated to him. He's the chieftain, he is the chief religious leader, so he's practicing his religion on the battlefield. This is an understandable motivation given the backstory on why that character would have gotten to where he is. The point I'm trying to say is, try not to be like one dimensional when it comes to what they want. Really think about what character motivations would be like. Do they wanna be the best? Do they wanna get out of battle if they're not a battle car participant, like our ragtag group of survivors example, right? Maybe they just wanna go home. Everyone just wants to go home. Um, those kinds of motivations that are very understandable and very relatable. Now, as I said, we're gonna be developing characters together. I have one based on a battle tome, and the other one's gonna be a free guild, sorry, free people's army that we're kind of making up as we go. So we're gonna start off with the free people's army, talking about our designs for that. So let's go over here. Uh, we'll go to free people's. Let's take a look at the kind of leaders that they have as options. Sorry, my microphone's in the way. I'm gonna to lean to the side a little bit. Uh, obviously, we have the free guild generals on griffins. I don't want my guy to be that pristine. You know what I mean? He's, he's kind of not that great. So let's pick let's pick this guy. This guy's gonna be my general. I like it. I like the way he looks. Um, I probably scrape off the KF for Carl Franz. Um, yeah, this is so. This is the model that I would use. Now, as far as theming him, we talked about before. Let's talk about where we want him to be from. Okay, so let's talk about. I brought out some brief ideas about what a backstory for this kind of hero would be. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't give a name to him yet. I, I keep going back and forth between like a French name and an old English one. But uh, he's going to be from Hammer Hall, Akshi. So he's going to be from a city in a land that is kind of defined by being aggressive, temperamental, those kinds of things. He's going to be very politically minded. He's not a combat soldier, but his battlefield is sort of the interweavings of high society. He got where he is by manipulating others, meaning that uh, maybe he didn't always earn the rank, but by clever blackmailing and uh, insubordination, he was able to arrive at control of a small company of free peoples and free guild from under the hands of his former. Now, his ultimate goal is that he wanted to be the leader of the city guard over in Hammerhall. He wanted a nice cushy job where he could direct troops, he could stay inside the nice cozy civilization and the fortifications there, and really just kind of soak up early retirement as best he could. However, in his rise to glory, in quotes, uh, he was able to really tick off a lot of 
uh, senators and leaders and political figures throughout the Hammerhall city's kind of upper echelon. And so their punishment to him was to send him into active duty. So that's how he got where he is. He is now the general of a small free people's company out amongst the mortal realms on sort of a tour of duty, if you will. And his real goal is to get home with this. If he makes it home alive, he will now have sort of a real military accolade to his name and will be able to take that job as the leader of the guard of Hammerhall, actually. So that's kind of his motivation. Survive to get home and prove your worth enough so that you can get the cozy, lazy job that you always wanted. It's a bit of a fun take, and the reason why I want it to be like that is I wanted the most non-heroic hero for my order army, and that's kind of my thinking. I like to deal in opposites, so like my Chaos Warriors, my actual models, are very clean, even though they're a very chaotic faction. Um, I want my heroes to be like anti-heroes. I don't want to root for this guy. He's kind of a turd, but uh, he's a really fun narrative character, so very aggressive. He's very intelligent, plays the political game. Uh, but is not so much equipped to be a leader of men. He's not inspiring to his troops, and so that's kind of the focus there. Now, of course, my next example is largely based on the Night Haunt Battle Tome, so we're going to head over and check out my general there. So I'm choosing to base this hero off the Knight of Shrouds model. Now, this is where the Battle Tome kind of comes in handy. They do fill in a little bit little lore nuggets if you will of backstory we know the knight of shrouds if you haven't watched that video already uh, on my channel are people who earned nagash's favor by betraying their own people meaning they sacrificed their entire society these were generals leaders kings things like that who basically offered their people to nagash freely in exchange for one immortality but two uh, to allow them to be soldiers for Nagash, kind of seeing that they couldn't win against him. So they were rewarded by this high office being able to kind of keep their minds intact. Uh, they are leaders of men, they're great generals, but they lost so much in the process and they're constantly reminded of the cost of immortality. Now this one I want to kind of play against kind of the rules and stuff that I had suggested earlier. By that I mean he does not know where he's from. This hero is from the Age of Myth. He goes way far back. And that's kind of what I'm doing is kind of uh, exchanging the uh, lore benefits that I get from having him be from a specific realm and playing up the kind of lore things that are possible in his specific battle tome. Meaning these guys are timeless. They are ageless. So he doesn't remember where he's from, but he has only memories of Nagash at this point. He's existed for eons serving his Dark Lord. So, for example, uh, we can really play up his age by saying um, we know that he offered his people up at some point, not really quite sure when, uh, in terms of like world history, but since then has spent in almost an eternity in service to Nagash. So he doesn't necessarily exude the same character traits and things like that of various realms, but instead he is all about Nagash. If you read the Black Library novels, when a lot of these heroes, when they're engaged in combat, if they've been in the service of Nagash for long enough, they just keep saying the same thing over and over again. Nagash is all, all our Nagash. And so this idea of it's an all-consuming mantra has taken over him rather than saying he's from fire, be aggressive, and so forth. As far as his character traits, he has a very dour nature and really no moral compass because he sees morality as just another kind of stumbling block to, of course, Nagash. Meaning um, it doesn't matter what you think is right or wrong. At some point, it just ends anyway. So why not just worship Nagash? As far as how he got to where he is, of course, we all know the backstory for Night of Shrouds. I just reviewed it. But in his specific case, when Lady Ollander was elected to be the new Mortark, she instated generals and kings to be in charge of her various processions, these large armies of Night Haunt the Undead. And at that point, he was handpicked by her for sort of his calm, um, unwavering demeanor, right? He's very dour. It's just, it's going to happen. He's very timeless in the sense that he's not in a rush to do anything. He's a very patient hunter. He's great at what he does in battle. And Lady Ollander saw that as a boon to these kind of fast moving, aggressive armies. It kind of tempers them. So she installed him as leader of one of her processions. And as far as what is he wants, he wants all life to end simply because he sees it as irrelevant. It's a waste of time because eventually all things will become what he is, which is an eternity of undeath. Again, we're going back to that idea of um, people having reasonable motivations for what they do based on their own personal experiences. He spent so much more time being this undead specter than he was as a king and, and being alive and experiencing life to the fullest it makes sense that he just sees the world like that. 
you're gonna come you're gonna join you're gonna be like this anyway might as well just do it now anything anything resisting that is a waste of time let me show you why and so that's kind of his working motivation the second part of our discussion on creating a hero is going to be talking about their flaws it's really easy when you're looking at this really cool model and developing a great backstory to make this like super unbeatable kick-ass hero and and kind of leave it there but the thing is is that heroes that are good at everything and have no weakness are incredibly uninteresting they're not good and so what i mean by that is there's no character development there's no progress there's nothing to push back on them uh, characters who don't have an arc in their storyline are very flat in novels and so having something that makes them count a peg something that weakens them some achilles heel is really important to creating a fun interesting character so no matter how great of a backstory you just made think about what they're bad at right think about what makes them what separates them from Nagash, right? Really, realistically, um, or whatever deity they worship, because those guys are far more perfect. What makes these guys where they're at in terms of the power level? Keep in mind, a flaw can be inward or outward. For example, like the Stormcast Eternal flaws are often the reforging process, and that creates internal uh, flaws in terms of uh, their memories are wiped and they lose uh, characteristics of their personality, things like that, which are very important and noticeable. But they also have some outward problems too, is that they shoot lightning or they become too aggressive, too um, infused and invigorated by like, dealing out justice and destroying chaos that they accidentally hurt their own people. Those kinds of things are very outward. We can see them uh, out in the world. Again, there could be a very outward uh, deformity in terms of like I worship Nurgle so I gain all kinds of nastiness those kinds of outward very easily recognizable problems or it can be more internal they're arrogant they're too young for their office they're not prepared they weren't well trained those kinds of things so going back to our example here of the free guild general the one that I had installed from Hammerhall actually uh, his flaw is going to be that he is incredibly petty right he's not a very likable man he's very easy to rouse to anger Again, he can be coaxed into battles he can't win if the enemy baits him, even in the least, because he's very short-sighted. Again, he uses these little political maneuvers to get where he's at, and that will end up biting him in the end. That's why he's in charge of this company. So I want to bring that to the tabletop in terms of he fights battles that are irresponsible. His men simply can't win, but it's a matter of personal pride, personal honor. He's a very petty person, and that we're going to play that out in his narrative. That's his huge flaw. And coming over to our Night Haunt leader, uh, we're going to have him as, again, we wanted him to be very morose, very dour, very slow and patient. And so uh, what his kind of flaws are going to be is that he sees units as expendable to a fault. By that I mean his army will quickly lose steam because he just keeps throwing them at the enemy unabashedly. Again, he doesn't see the point. It's all going to end anyway. Um, he doesn't take the time to be tactical about his attacks. How can I win with the fewest losses? Those kinds of things. In addition to that, he doesn't really win quick enough for what the higher-ups in Nighthaunt want to see. He's not a decisive general. He just is a slow, plodding, inexorable force, which is great, but not when it comes to a fast, assault, aggressive-based army like the Nighthaunt are. Number three is going to be very fast, and that's just discussing how your general likes to fight. I want you to imagine you're reading a scene from a Black Library book. Uh, what is your character doing when a fight ensues? Are they giving like rousing speeches like Vandis Hammerhand does in the opening of the Rumgate Wars? Are they very quiet? Are they in the back? Do they support kind of the army from the rear in terms of like keeping the troops uh, motivated from behind or directing archers? Those kinds of things. How do they like to fight? Are they aggressive, defensive? Are they very mobile? Are they kind of static, like they go to a place in the battlefield and just hunker down and defend it? Do they prefer a ranged or melee combat? Again, ask all those questions and then think, what units do I have in my army that kind of best represent that? In addition to that, do they have an honor guard? Do they have a unit that stays by them in the battle to kind of ensure their safety? Which is kind of a fun idea that you can make a really cool customized honor guard with a lot of uh, conversions and things like that. What kind of weapons, warriors, those kinds of things on the battlefield do they trust in most? For example, if you, your general was to come to you and say, they'll never see blank coming, they're putting trust in that thing. If it was like, they'll never see our cannons coming, the, that means you are relying heavily on your cannon and artillery firepower to get the job done. Same thing with handgunners, 
Uh, could be the chain rasps in terms of like flooding the enemy. They'll never be prepared for the amount of bodies we can throw at them. Those kinds of things. Think about what your general trusts in the most. Again, it doesn't have to be a weapon or even a unit. It could simply be a religious icon. If you are the devoted of Sigmar, uh, you could put all your trust in the uh, like the war altar, right? That kind of iconography of your religious zeal brought to the battlefield. Those are the kind of things, whatever they trust in the most. Okay, we come back to our free guild general, our free people's general. Um, we're looking at the kind of units they have access to, and I went ahead and writ wrote out a little thing. Uh, so my guy uses cavalry to harass the enemy into a good firing lane and then opens them up. So he's going to have some of the cavalry type units here, but their main purpose is to kind of harry the enemy into a kind of good center position so that the handgunners can open up and rain down some fiery, fiery death. So I'm going to focus more on the synergies based on handgunners, but also having these lighter, fast units that can kind of keep the enemy um together right like keep them in a good firing lane and you have the gunners at the bottom shooting and you can kind of get a lot of work done there to answer some of the questions i said before these guys are gonna be very aggressive with the horsemen but very defensive with the firing arm meaning uh, the hand gunners and uh there's no religious iconography here nothing like that very static when it comes to the center of the table now moving over to our night haunt armies we're talking about uh for them looking at kind of the many, many more options they have available. Uh, for my Knight of Shrouds, I want him to be concerned with getting as many souls as possible in the care of Nagash. So we're looking at larger units. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we're gonna focus on particularly Chain Rasps. I like the Chain Rasp hordes. I think they're gorgeous looking models. And uh, what they are all about is the slow, inexorable advance. Remember the general, his flaws are that he takes his time, he's too patient, well, we're gonna basically exemplify that by a, a unit that moves an average speed um, and there's a lot of them so that his favorite way of fighting is to overwhelm the enemy because death in and of itself is a very overwhelming idea and um, by doing so they're going to kill you one-on-one -on -one, and there's gonna be lots of guardians of souls and other uh, units like that to resurrect the dead in combat so uh, he's going to focus on horde armies being patient thorough and um, bringing as many dead back to life as he can. And number four is gonna be very quick and simple, and that is character interactions. I often say that Josh Reynolds is my favorite Black Library author, and the reason for that is simply he does character interactions like nobody else. The dialogue that brings up the flavor of each army is just absolutely top notch. I really recommend his work. Now, way, how are we gonna bring that to the tabletop? Well, obviously, um, this requires you to kind of stop here for your general and go back and write out stories and flaws and how they like to fight for other various uh, heroes in your army. I want to give some examples here, but be very light and brief. The idea being is, as you're creating the narrative for this army, start with the general and branch out with the other heroes and think about what does well to contrast your general to make it more interesting. Just a few questions to kind of ask yourself as you're doing the other probably various minor other heroes more support heroes is uh why are they specifically following this general do they share the same attitudes and temperament are they from the same place those kinds of things um where are they when the fight begins because usually the general stays in the back and the, the lieutenants and things like that go out there and kind of lead the men more individually do they do that do they do the opposite how does that army fight there? Are they seeking to usurp the general? So for a lot of chaos armies, everyone wants to be the Lord of Chaos, right? The one who's on top of the pyramid. Um, so there's always that kind of threat of backstabbing, whereas order factions tend to be more organized. There's a stricter hierarchy. No one's trying to stab their leader in the back and those kinds of things. Uh, another thing focusing on flaws is to ask simply, why aren't they in charge? If they're a character worth noting and they're great at leading people, how come they're not the general? And that's kind of a fun way to look at flaws for them. And also, what kind of contrast do they add to the army? And we'll go through real quick and look at those examples. Okay, so we're back here looking at the free people's army. And we have the free guild general. But let's say I wanted to make a lieutenant who could be below him and uh, kind of motivate the troops as alongside him. Remember, our main general guy is very petty. We don't like him very much. But let's pick a different model. Doesn't matter if it's the same unit profile wise, just something, someone else to really represent something different. So we're gonna pick this guy with his crazy cool looking double handed sword he's got here. And uh, once we give him a name, we're gonna say that he's Lieutenant under the General and uh, he is not in charge because of his youth. 
okay? Simply cut, he's just not old enough, he's not seasoned enough as a veteran, a warrior, and things like that to really be in charge of this army. Uh, he is optimistic, he is happy with the soldier's life, and he values things like honor and duty. Puts him in stark contrast to the pettiness, the political gaming of his general. Uh, he does his best to inspire and rally the men and really direct their fire. So if you're looking at the tabletop, this guy is going to be far more involved in the battle up front uh, with the firing line, whereas the general is going to be more towards the back. Um, his personality is contrasting with the general while still adding to the efficiency of the army on the tabletop. And because of the way that, you know, order armies tend to structure themselves, it makes sense that somebody would just simply outrank him. There's no reason why this happens in the military all the time. You have more ambitious, more positive soldiers who are underneath more jaded, uh, seasoned veterans. Happens every single day. Okay, going over to our Knight of Shrouds example. Remember, our general is very dour, very patient. Um, he is a slow, plotting person, likes to overwhelm the enemy with a lot of numbers who kind of move inexorably rather than fast and aggressive. And we're going to have our person under him be a Lord Executioner. Now, this their model has a name for some reason, but it's just a Lord Executioner. That's all he is, right? Yep, Lord Executioner. Uh, I love the one that came in the two-player starter set. I think it looks super cool. This guy's legit as well. And for him, this Lord Executioner hates being under his general. In sharp contrast, he has a lot more personality than our leader, who is very, like I said, dour, very almost emotionless about why he does what he does. And he has a very aggressive temperament, our Lord Executioner does. Uh, probably remembers a bit of his life, uh, human life, I should say. Uh, likely from the realm of fire, but not necessarily. And what he loves to do is ride ahead of the enemy and hit the foes really hard with like moving with hex raids and other fast moving units to kind of give a decisive blow to the enemy, take out their main points of defense before the kind of overwhelming tide of chain rasps comes in with the general. He really, really hates his general, like I said before, wants to usurp him uh, because he is so tired of the patient, slow moving force. He wants to get in there. He's more like a shock troop. Want to get in there, want to dazzle the enemy, put him on the back foot and then take them out. And really he wants to lead for himself. He wants to stand before Lady Ollander and kind of receive those accolades and that praise coming from her. And, and there's a difference in temperament here because I want my Lord Executioner to find freedom in death, right? I, he loves being free because he views the human body as like a shackle, a chain that bears him down. Whereas the um, actual leader, the, the general, Knight of Shrouds, uh, views death as being like, it's going to happen anyway, it might as well happen now. There's a difference in kind of your enthusiasm level between saying, no, this is freeing me versus it's just going to happen. So friends, those are my thoughts on making a kind of cool, comprehensive narrative, starting with your general and then kind of going to the various lieutenants. Don't forget, if you do the same thing for all of your lower or supporting heroes, um, when you're including, the more of them you do this for, include how they relate to one another, not just how they relate to the general. I think that'd be really, really fun to see how this force kind of is kind of slammed together, right? I mean, and uh, having some support heroes who are just like the general is contrasted with some who are incredibly opposite like we did here uh, i think could go a long way to adding a really cool flavorful narrative to your army the point i want to make here is that it just takes a little bit of work to have a lot of fun building a story arc for your miniatures this whole setup is a lot of fun for campaigns um, if you're just starting off path to glory is a great way to pick one general develop that story build the army as he would see fit he or she would see fit and then kind of drive that narrative home all campaigns are a great way to do this but also here's the thing let's say you're a narrative player and your friends are not so much into that they're more competitive um, i do this quite frequently i have like one of those battle journal things and i just keep notes of like I have a story for my army. I don't care that you're not playing a story game. I am, and I'm having fun. And this is what my faction did uh, when he bumped into your uh, army on the battlefield. And so like, you know, if you've watched the Rerolling Ones, um, the Path to Glory campaign we did, I had uh, Valorous, who was the Chaos Source Lord in a Mana Core. And I keep stories about that guy. Um, what his forces did is they bumped into the various things that I've played normal games with. I didn't, wasn't even playing a narrative-based game with some of my friends. But I went home and I made my own little tether that brought the stories together. 
But as with every video, this is the start of a discussion. So I would love to hear the backstory for your forces, what you've made. I'll leave kind of a more detailed description of Valrix, the leader of the um, Slaves of Darkness down below. And I wanna hear the heroes that you've created and how you bring those to life on the battlefield. Thank you all so much for watching and happy wargaming.